Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. It's called Transforming Organizations, How to Integrate DEI Strategies for Lasting Impact. We're here today as a part of the Diversity Symposium put on by Colorado State University. And before we get started, I wanted to speak about the CSU land acknowledgement. So I'd like to read it off to you. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other Native American tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. All these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard. The ties, nations, have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly that our founding came at a dire cost to native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility and commitment. So thank you for that. And now I'd like to introduce ourselves. So we are the Acacia Company. Uh, my name is Natalie Rogers, she, her. We've also got Tu Hong Nguyen and Tari Betts here with us today as well. So we are a diversity, equity and inclusion consulting firm that focuses on integrating DEI strategy into business operations. So the three of us have experience around DEI programming, HR, business operations, and business consulting, as well as project management. And we're really looking forward to speaking with you today. So what are you going to learn today? The objectives of today's session are to identify where systemic barriers prevent equitable outcomes in the various spheres of oppression. You'll also Practice applying multi-dimensional systems thinking at the institutional level for your organization. And you'll leave with actionable steps that can be taken right away to start removing oppressive barriers and making positive change from your seat. So let's get started. I want to begin uh, by aligning on a couple of definitions. We talk about DEI a lot um, and Language is really powerful. So I wanna make sure we're all on the same page here. So for the purposes of this session today, this is how we will define diversity, equity, and inclusion. So starting with diversity, what it is. So DEI has been a buzzword and can be interpreted differently, but diversity is, is probably one of the terms that you're, you're most likely really familiar with. So it refers to the differences and the variations in a group that encompass a variety of identities and experiences. But what it is not is a proxy for race, uh, ability, sexuality, or other characteristics. And it's really important not to use the term diversity or diverse as a proxy for these things. And one thing I wanna to note too is keeping in mind that a group can be diverse, but a person cannot be diverse. So keep that in mind as we go through today. Next, we've got equity on the list. This one can be a little bit harder uh, of a concept to understand and it's often equated to equality. Um, there's a common belief that in order to promote fairness, we must prioritize equality, meaning that we provide everyone with the same thing. Equity, however, recognizes that each person doesn't start from the same place. And it's important to allocate the right resources, the exact resources, um, access and opportunities needed to reach an equally high outcome of success for all people, regardless of any social or cultural factors. Equity is truly not equality, <laughs> which is of course treating everyone the same with the goal of promoting fairness. The concept of fairness is, is really only relevant when everyone starts at the same place. <laughs> so that's really the key difference here between equity and equality. Equity is sometimes perceived as unfair by many people, 
because it levels the playing field and alloc allocates resources based on need. But in, in the end, it's really about the outcomes and about that equal opportunity for success. Okay, so now we've got inclusion, third one. So inclusion is about valuing and incorporating the perspectives, contributions, needs, and viewpoints of all people. Often people equate inclusion to being invited to a party and being asked to dance. But this is actually a little bit of a limiting view. True inclusion is not just being invited to the party and getting asked to dance, it's also being a part of the creation of the party uh, from the beginning, right? Getting involved, getting the input, actually contributing from the get-go. Um, and, you know, it it's, involves co-creation. That is a key, key piece here, especially in organizations. This is a really important note, is that inclusion truly is really successful with co-creation. So what it's not, um, you know, a lot of DEI work necessarily focuses on bringing in various communities, perspectives and backgrounds, but doesn't always provide those communities the space to co-create and, and that's the key. And it's not just an, under, an invitation for underrepresented groups to be present in an existing space. Um, so to, to highlight a, a little bit of a personal example, um, a friend of ours, recently shared a story with us about their mother who uses a wheelchair in their day-to-day -day and her experience with uh, inclusive housing. So you may all be familiar with inclusive housing um, given to different developments and things like this, but um, they're deemed to be accessible with, you know, to those with different abilities. But the truth is that a lot of these housing developments actually are not <laughs> inclusive and they weren't all designed um, to actually have inclusion in mind. So our friend's mom, for example, went um, to view her apartment um, and the elevator actually that, <laughs> that they deemed this apartment to be inclusive housing did not work. And there were stairs leading up to the apartment. There were no wheelchair access. Um, so it wasn't actually truly thought about <laughs> with the the person in mind, the, truly the person who needed these things was not centered. So can't, can't use a wheelchair upstairs to get to the elevator. So, uh, you know, having now these, these definitions under our belt, I wanna kind of bring it now to a couple of statistics that help maybe ground ourselves a little bit in, in a little bit of the reality, the current state of D, E, and I in organizations and in institutions. And I just want you to take a second to look at these and, and read through them. Um, what they demonstrate from my perspective is, is that there is a lot of opportunity to integrate diversity, equity, and inclusion into organizations. And it, these statistics are, are so shocking in, in so many ways. I mean, if you look at disengaged employees cost $3,400 for every $10,000 in sales, that's a big percentage. And that's a big impact on an organization, whether you're private or, or public. So diversity, equity, and inclusion truly do have an impact. You know, there are, when we look at how it, it interacts with institutions, it, it really does affect all, all systems. And to give a, a few examples of these systems that, that maybe you've seen, right? How does this actually show up? Well, you know, we can look at, for example, if we look at equity, lack of tra pay transparency resulting in the gender gap being perpetuated. We can look at uh, mobility and pay and leadership. Um, if you look at, you know, educational institutions, you can look at who actually gets elevated, who gets tenure, who is, you know, getting put into decision-making roles. Um, how do the intersections of age and race and gender play into that, right? If we look at inclusion, uh, we can look at accessibility in, in coursework, for example, and, and if you look at higher education, how is the material being presented? And is it accommodating for multiple learning styles? Um, is it truly centering students 
sometimes, you know, I, I understand as a facilitator, often it's, it's easy for me to, to center what makes sense for my style of presenting uh, instead of what does the audience really need from me, right? Um, if we look at diversity, some of these systems that get in the way are, could be referral programs that incentivize homo homogenous um, institutions and organizations. We can look at representation of staff and faculty. Often in higher education, there's a big conversation around students <laughs> and representation there and diversity there. Um, but what about faculty and staff and the people who are leading the organizations? So um, we can see that, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, of systems that really truly are <laughs> trying to work against diversity, equity, and inclusion. But when we actually put some intention and some focus on those things, the, the outcomes can be quite impactful and positively impactful. So I wanna go here now to, to a, a couple of questions, a little bit of space of reflection. Uh, just some food for thought. We get asked a lot, how do I, how do I start? What do I start with? <laughs> how do I prioritize different initiatives for my organization? Um, so they wanna put your attention to this first bullet that you can't have diversity without inclusion. And what we mean by that is that if you try to bring in a bunch of folks to an organization that is very exclusionary and a very homogenous, very clicky, it could be all kinds of things, right? But those people are not going to feel welcome. They're not going to feel like they belong in that space. So think about how do you get, you know, how do you clean up inside the organization internally first and create systems and structures that actually are going to welcome diversity and representation into your organization. And the same goes with equity. If you think about equity, um, you've got to start with some of these things that really truly set people up for success. You know, the structures, the systems, what does pay look like? What does the hiring process look like? Making sure that, that we really are being fair and equitable. Um, so keep that in mind as you start to get into this work that there is a way to do this, right? With, to make sure we don't cause more unintentional harm than, than, than we mean to. Thanks, Natalie. I'd like to take just a few seconds to read a definition of oppression. When we think about what's against or working against or the systems at play uh, that are truly a barrier to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, some form of oppression is at the root. So we have a definition here by Diane Goodman that says oppression is a system of advantage and disadvantage based on social group membership. Some groups are advantaged, seen as superior, have greater social power and receive unearned benefits, while other groups are seen as disadvantaged, seen as inferior, has less social power and face discrimination and violence. When you think about forms of oppression or various isms, racism, sexism, classism, ableism, it may be difficult to see these issues as sort of an interlocking system operating at various levels. Much of this may stem from the fact that many individuals only see or hear of examples at the interpersonal level of oppression. So think about an individual telling a racist joke or making a homophobic slur. We're going to walk through the various levels of oppression, which will sort of broaden our understanding of how oppression does operate as a system and impacts various areas of our lives, like where we work, where we go to school, how we interact with people day to day. This slide here just serves the visual of some different levels of oppression that we'll be defining here. Systems of oppression and their effects on people have a really long history, deeply rooted in our society and across the world. 
Sometimes discussions about oppression do reduce it down to individual acts of discrimination or one-ism, as I mentioned before, but it's really important to recognize that oppression operates on different levels, internalized, interpersonal, institutional, and structural. The many isms at the intersections of these levels are often at play simultaneously and have widespread implications on all societal domains, whether it's our education system, our justice system, housing, employment, wealth, and more. So it's important that we understand also that the focus is on the impact or outcomes of oppression versus the intent or the well unintended act of an individual actor or institution. We'll talk a couple about the individual levels, which are internalized and interpersonal oppression. And then we'll talk about some systemic levels, which are institutional and structural oppression. So we'll start with internalized. Internalized oppression occurs within individuals. When people are targeted, discriminated against and oppressed over a long period of time, they often internalize, meaning their internal view of themselves and others in their group reflects the myths and misinformation that society communicates to them about themselves. They unconsciously believe the ideology that oppression perpetuates. An example may be someone not applying to competitive colleges because they don't believe they're good enough. You may think though it's fairly reasonable for anyone to believe they aren't good enough for something, whether it's a particular college or a job, we've all faced imposter syndrome, but it's important to interrogate where these messages come from to make someone believe this way. In a lot of cases, internalized oppression is at the root. We'll move on to defining interpersonal oppression, which occurs between individuals and this is where the individual and systemic levels of oppression sort of intersect between the same social identity groups and other marginalized groups or members of dominant groups. Interpersonal oppression plays out constantly, whether it's conscious or not. And this level of oppression is what we see at play most often throughout the various acts of isms, right? A, a racist comment, a microaggression towards a person of color, like telling them they're surprisingly articulate. Let's talk a bit about some of the systemic levels. So both institutional and structural oppression are examples of systemic oppression, which exists at the level of institutions, includes things like harmful policies and practices, and it occurs across structures. So think education as a whole in our country, the healthcare system as a whole in our country, transportation, our economy. So these levels of systemic oppression are interconnected and reinforcing over time. So thinking about institutional oppression specifically, it occurs within an institution. These are things reflected in our laws, the legal system, education system, housing, and more. It's sort of a, a system of visible and invisible barriers that harm marginalized communities and is reinforced by our society. Institutional laws, customs, or practices often produce inequities for particular groups across race, gender, class, and other identities but it's a really vast and cumulative multifaceted system that includes both overt and covert discriminatory practices and behaviors. I wanna talk about an example in academia, uh, similar to what Natalie pointed out earlier. You know, Think about the lack of representation in faculty, particularly for those tenured or on a tenured track. Tenured positions are extremely important to the institution for a number of reasons. It's a concept closely tied to academic freedom, since the security of tenure allows professors to research and teach any topic, even more controversial ones, and it offers protection. Tenured professors, though, are largely white, 
and male, and would also be the same ones making up departmental tenure committees and historically shaping the expectations and standards required for tenure, thus fueling inequity. If largely white and male professors are the ones able to more freely pursue and share research and knowledge, this points to a larger institutional problem when academic progress is mostly pursued or defined by homogenous groups. And this is just really one example that highlights a power structure within an institutional decision-making process. This sort of issue though, while occurring within an academic institution, certainly does have a ripple effect on historically excluded groups. And so we'll talk about that in our structural oppression slide. And as I mentioned a bit ago, structural oppression occurs across institutions, society, and cultures as a whole. You can think of it as an entire system of hierarchy and inequity across institutions that adversely impact marginalized groups. It sort of lies underneath and across our society and has multiplicative effects throughout history. Privileged groups are advantaged while oppressed groups experience adverse outcomes. You can think of structural oppression like a big ripple effect. I know I mentioned this earlier, but we do sometimes tend to personalize the argument of oppression. You know, for example, racism. As if people smiled to each other, were polite and nice to each other and just opened doors for one another, then we'd be fine and racism is over. But this is sort of a message sort of planted intentionally to distract us from institutional responses and structures of racism. And so when we don't tackle things at the systemic level, the less overt things that were a little harder to, to point out or make sense of, it creates an even bigger ripple effect of inequities that are harming marginalized groups. A couple of examples, you, you can think about segregation, voter suppression, gerrymandering, redlining. In academia in particular, there are a lot of structural problems that have historically impacted marginalized people. And there's a lot of evidence that racism, for example, has played a key role in the structure and function of academic institutions. It very well impacts what gets researched, what is taught in courses, the methods that are used, the overall culture that negatively impacts marginalized faculty and students. You know, a common sentiment regarding structural oppression specifically is that it's too complicated, too big of an issue to solve. But I just want to point out that it's not an excuse to not do anything about it. Because if no one ever feels sort of the inner call to tackle these larger systemic issues, things will never change. When it comes to systemic level, of course, the barriers are much higher and it's such it's so much more complicated uh, to, to solve. It's not something that we can solve completely on our own when we talk about systemic levels of oppression within academia, for example. But there's a lot of impact that you can have that can help solve the issue from your seat. So it's important for us to sort of accept the higher barriers that come with this work and think about the individual impact that you can have and acknowledge the systemic oppression that does exist on different levels, often simultaneously. And that way we can really come together and bring true structural transformation to the systems that we do operate in. This next slide here just serves as another, another visual reminder of sort of these levels of oppression and how they are reinforcing and at play simultaneously and sort of feed into one another. Whether or not it's easy to identify or not, systemic oppression shows up in all areas of our lives. Really, whether or not we can see these issues can also depend on our own individual identity and experiences. It can be hard to recognize if a system is unjust, if it seems to be working for you or people that identify the same way as you. 
that's why it's important to always recognize your blind spots, what you don't know, as much as what you do know and what you can contribute. You may not always be best suited to see all the potential injustices or inequities at play because you just may not be close to or exposed to those issues. This lack of knowledge, though, doesn't make you a bad person, but by learning more, you'll uncover more and be open to admitting where you may need to bring in other perspectives, where you need to learn more in order to build with inclusivity in mind from the beginning. This visual here is sort of piggybacking on the, the last slide here that serves as a reminder that the levels of oppression, whether we're talking about various forms of discrimination, the many isms at play, they're not always obvious and not always easy to understand as an interlocking system at play. But there are a lot of ways that oppression is already present in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's the schools that we go to, as I mentioned, where we work or how we interact with people. And here's just a couple of reflection statements here. You know, when we do operate within a larger system, it is important to actively consider how we change it. It's also important to understand our positions of power or privilege within a given system and learn how to leverage or lend our power or privilege. So we encourage you to think a bit about your spheres of influence and where you can make a difference in your circles that you occupy day to day in your lives, where you work, where you attend classes. I know it's a bit of a paradox that does require us to hold two things to be true at the same time. One is, I'm a part of a system that was in its origin, not designed inclusively. And two, I can do my part in this system so that even when I may benefit from it because it was designed to advantage people who look like me, there is something that I can do to disrupt that and change within my own scope and sphere of influence. Thank you, Terry. Yes, so continuing on, on that note, it's important to recognize that oppression shows up in places that might not be so obvious, and both the private and public institutions that we move throughout. So we mentioned um, a, a handful of examples on the university and academic level. Um, public institutions can also include NGOs and nonprofits. Um, and private institutions like our corporations and businesses. So it's important to remember that no matter public or private, all institutions, all organizations have processes. So a way of selecting, hiring, bringing in folks, you know, in the, on the university level, that means students and faculty alike, um, processes that help us you know, recognize and evaluate people for their contributions and decide whose work gets rewarded or elevated. Um, and all of these decisions are made by people. So um, you might be feeling a, a little bit overwhelmed and especially operating in, in higher education, it's likely to feel that you can't change everything. It's such a big problem. It's such a large and complex um, institution to, to tackle. Uh, so we want to introduce a model that can help you contextualize where your organization is at. And when we say organization, that can mean many things. That could mean your team, your department, your student group. Um, and all of these things, please remember, don't have to happen at once. So this model is to show you a general path um, and a, a general direction for how you can grow. So the first stage of this model of how we can begin to enact change is this first stage of building awareness. Um, this stage is when you're learning and you're bringing folks on board and you're educating other people and building a foundation where diversity, equity, and inclusion can thrive. 
The next stage is gaining momentum. This is the stage where initiatives uh, start to, to really take structure and it's important here that leadership becomes more involved in amplifying DEI goals, initiatives, um, and projects. This next stage is structural transformation. This is where really structural changes are happening across an organization. So really the things that impact processes and removing bias from operations and processes and starting to take the steps to measure equity, this is the stage where that happens. And this last stage is sustainable growth. This is where your organization is continuing to grow, innovate, and really cultivating a overall culture of belonging. Um, this is the last stage, but it's important to know that this stage is all about continuous, continuous growth. So it's important to reevaluate where there are opportunities to improve. Um, I, to be honest, there are not a lot of organizations at this stage. So it's really important to think about and really honestly evaluate where your organization is and how the marginalized communities in your organization experience it. Um, and a quick note here, if you are have not yet started in your DEI journey and, and starting to integrate DEI into your organization, there is a pre-stage where there might not be a lot of activity or very little activity. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That just means that you can see the path ahead. Um, and at that stage, it's really important to start identifying who are the leaders in your organization who can enact change. It's important to start to gather and organize passionate, dedicated folks. And so you might be wondering, what does it take to get from one stage to the next? And I'll just go through this over a high level um, and go in depth in the next slides. But for, for this first step, it's really important to demonstrate success. So you wanna make sure that the initiatives that you're putting on, um, there might be a lot of grassroots and initiatives at this point. It's important to demonstrate success, um, have things like, track things like participation, engagement, satisfaction for events and programming. To get from gaining momentum to structural transformation, we talked about this a little bit. It's all about increasing ownership. So that means across the institution and also identifying leaders who can help take on DEI and help scale it out across the organization. And to get from structural transformation to sustainable growth, this is where integrating DEI into the daily operations, the daily decision making um, within your organization is going to be really important. At this point, DEI is not a separate initiative. It's part of your, of your daily operations. So we'll go over each stage one at a time and I'll expand on what this stage means. And as I mentioned, there is a pre-stage where there's little to no activity. Um, and as I mentioned at that point, it's really important to bring ident and identify leaders who can come together. So the first stage of the model is building awareness. Um, this is the stage where education, trainings, and conversations are very important to organizational learning. So at this stage, make the space for DEI. Have, of course, learnings at every stage, but at this part in the beginning, it's very important for your organization to establish a common language and a common understand, understanding around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you want to make sure that in order to have demonstrated success, in order to see growth, you'll need to focus and prioritize your efforts. And I'll go into more depth at this next point, at this next stage of gaining momentum, because at this stage, it feels really exciting because there are a lot of DEI initiatives happening. And that's why it's so important to start to focus and prioritize because you're gonna want to keep that momentum up, but it's simply not sustainable to do everything at once. Um, so here, start to advocate for more formal structures that give DEI a common direction, a cohesive vision, an aligned plan across your organization, 
And if you have different grassroots efforts, start to align those and start to help these groups and initiatives get some structure and come together and, and have a cohesive direction. So you may need to do things like centralized communication, um, organize your initiatives or programs, secure a formal budget for DEI, um, incorporate DEI into an organizational mission or vision, um, creating a strategic plan for DEI. These are the things that really help align folks and create more structure that makes the next stage more possible. Um, and growth is possible at this stage through sponsorship on the leadership level and increased ownership throughout the organization. What that means is you'll really need the power and influence that that senior leaders have to be able to take your DEI initiatives across the organization. And then simultaneously, you'll also need to think about how you can increase the ownership of the middle level of leadership within your organization. So at a university, that might be department heads or professors um, or different other faculty who leads teams or departments. And so focus on upskilling those folks. Give them the skills and resources they need to disseminate DEI strategy for their team or for their department um, and effectively host conversations about DEI. Um, that might mean focusing on their personal buy-in. And that could take a lot of resources and time. But really, that is the foundation for DEI integration to scale. So going into the third stage, which is structural transformation. At this part, at this part of, of our model, um, DEI is a part of your organizational conversation. Um, and it's time for initiatives to not simply tackle one part of your organization, but truly be integrated into decision making and daily operations throughout. So you'll need to take a comprehensive approach that tackle systemic barriers um, that may exist for faculty and students alike. At this stage, you'll want to think about how do we make diversity, equity, inclusion relevant to every department or every individual. Um, that could mean something like baking DEI into specific departmental curriculum, um, requiring professors to think about and apply an anti-oppression or, or a DEI lens to their lectures, um, thinking about ways to make DEI real for folks. So, Things like vague statements of, um, about or missions about you know inclusive communication become very real. It means it means defining what does inclusive com inclusive communication actually look like, and how do folks experience our organization? And growth at this stage is um, is possible by addressing systemic changes. So that means maintaining a culture of transparency and keeping this openness towards feedback and continually improving and growing and hearing how folks experience the organization and taking that in and actioning on that. And this last stage of sustainable growth. Um, at this stage, inclusion, access, belonging, justice, these things become the heart of how your organization operates and becomes vital in how you approach decision making. You've taken steps to balance power throughout the organization in a way that's fair and doesn't exploit or marginalize people. And the positive things about this stage is that when you're in a, a stage of sustainable growth, the benefits of DEI start to have returns on the organization. So it pays off to be recognized as an inclusive organization because that's what is, is attractive to people and, and you know, um, keeps them coming in and also staying. So growth is possible at this stage by continuing to learn and adapt and stay you know, on the ground and, and keep an ear on what is happening in the world around us. So learning from other organizations um, and continuing to stay plugged into how you can continue to evolve and, um, you know, push the barrier of what does inclusion mean. So we talked about 
the different thresholds. So I'll go over this kind of as a, as a recap and on a high level. So to focus on how to move from each stage to the next, building awareness. Really here, you can see the, the details on this slide, but really here, focus and prioritization is key. For gaining momentum, this is where it's important to think about what kinds of activities you're doing um, and really more how those activities are happening and how we engage senior leadership to be part of those and help disseminate those messages out. This third stage of structural transformation, what's really important here is to examine your, your processes, leave no stone unturned. Um, and at this stage, you're really starting to engage this critical mass of folks who maybe are not necessarily interested in DEI, but could just simply just be indifferent because they don't see how it it impacts their daily lives um, and it might feel like extra work and so this is where at this stage it's really important to institutionalize create structural ways for DEI to be part of people's day-to-day -day jobs and the way they experience the organization and at this stage as I mentioned it's important to continue learning um, it's it's interesting at sustainable growth you know, DEI, it's important to remember that this ideal state is a continually moving target. What was inclusive yesterday is simply not acceptable anymore. And so it's at this stage, we want to see organizations that continue innovating because that's how you um, continue to stay relevant and continue to grow and learn. So we have some, some reflection points to think about. Um, and so the first one is, what are the common pitfalls? So there, there are a lot of th different things that can happen at each stage, but I want to focus on two big pitfalls that can happen. Um, the first one is, what happens when I face hesitation? How do I counter resistance along the way? Um, and in the change management space, this is very normal. Um, we talk about resistance, but really we want to, we use that term loosely to describe any sort of hesitation. Um, and so here it's really important to, to listen to folks um, and, and hear more about where is this hesitation coming from. Um, that, those concerns might be valuable pieces of data that can help you adapt your DEI integration strategy in a way that brings everyone along and really addresses the heart of the issue. So for example, it could come up that people simply don't understand how diversity, equity, and inclusion benefits them. They believe it's it's a common misconception that DEI is only DEI programs only benefit one specific class or uh, one group. And so there might be uh, there might be a need to do a little bit of myth busting um, and educate folks that DEI, like the tide that lifts all boats, benefits everyone in the organization. Um, and so these things come up and, and when you start to listen to what are those points of hesitation for the organization, um, so you can think about how to address those. And the second common pitfall is accountability structures. So. We talk a lot about accountability because it is essential to justice. These two things go hand in hand. Um, but at what part of the model does it make sense to stand up processes for accountability and, and really structures for accountability if someone, say, violates DEI goals or goes against DEI behaviors that we've defined? What's the consequence? Um, that's important to think about because if there's no consequence, then you know people won't go along. There's no need to go along with DEI if you don't have to. Um, but then if you introduce it too soon, it could push. It could lead to some pushback that might undermine the diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts that you've already made. So we say here that it's really important to work with people's um, expectations and what they're ready for and thinking about the timing behind when to introduce those accountability structures. Um, ideally, it's something that, that does happen in the third stage, but again, listen to your organization and define, you know, bring 
folks on board and define what accountability is. It's not this gotcha moment trap to catch people who say the wrong thing, um, but really it's about making sure the space and environment is safe for everyone. And so think about when you, be careful about when you introduce those. And um, yeah, we really see that in that in that third or fourth stage when you're implementing structural changes. And so something else um, to keep in mind and reflect on is, is you know, there's, we just sent out, we just said a lot of information. And so it's important to kind of think about what are the things, if I leave this conversation, that I really need to remember about each stage? What do I need to keep in mind for implementing a DEI integration um, strategy into my organization and a growth path that makes sense for our reality? So if, you're at, if you remember anything, this first stage is really about creating space for DEI. You're building awareness. You want to make sure there's space for these conversations um, and also capacity for folks to talk about these things in a way that doesn't take away from their daily work or their uh, and that there's space for them to do things, do these things um, as part of their jobs. The second stage of gaining momentum, um, here it's really important to focus and align. Focus your efforts um, and align between different initiatives to make sure there's a cohesive vision. For structural transformation, leave no stone unturned. Make sure you are examining your processes and really looking at the outcomes. Are you, is your organization producing equitable outcomes? And this last stage, sustainable growth. What to keep in mind is, is ask yourself this question of what more is possible? If you continually ask yourself this and reflect on this, you'll be an organization that continues to learn and grow. So we know that this journey can feel long and it absolutely requires lifelong learning, but we want you all to remember how truly important this work is and how valuable you are just by attending and learning about this more and, and hopefully taking back what you've learned here today to your organization. And so it's really important that there is someone like you in your organization, on your team, in your institutions that cares about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this work is important not only because we care, right? We know that it's the right thing to do, but we also know that successful DEI has positive metrics and a positive impact on organizations across the board. So things like improved retention, increased engagement, you know, a higher perception, uh, positive perception, and just an overall higher um, attitude um, towards relations between the institution and its staff, students. These things are things that any organization would be happy to have. And so we want to recognize all of you for putting in all of the work you're already doing by just being here and committing to learning more. Of course, you can always reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, these, this is our contact information as well as our social media. Um, we would love to hear from you and, and we thank you so much for the time today. It was really enjoyable to get the chance to talk to you all. Um, and yes, hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.